it's a great honor to be here. Uh, I'm very pleased to uh, be presenting on just a few thoughts in the 15 minutes that I have that are related to this session to topic, which is focusing in particular on, on policy. So just in, th in thinking about uh, or motivating this a little bit, I think you've, you've heard last night uh, and so far in the conference a few facts. So the first is that there are important differences in cultural traits, identity across societies. These are vast. Uh, Western societies aren't the norm, aren't the median, aren't the average. Um, and then the other thing is that these are historically determined. So they evolve through an evolutionary process. There's a systematic logic, uh, and it's not, not just random, these differences that we see. And these things are important for economic development, both the history, so events that happened long ago because they affect this evolutionary process, and then more proximately the culture uh, today are important for economic development. Okay, so I'm not going to talk about these, although I'm happy to take questions afterwards, and much of my research has focused on these questions. So I'm going to talk about, I think, things that I've started to think about just in the last year. And this is really, you know, one could say, okay, if this, if this is all true, that's fine. Uh, but what I want to do, and I think what many people in this room want to do, is just improve the world, right? So I want to fix the problems or help fix the problems that exist today. So if that's what I want to do, why do I need to know about the history, the culture, et cetera? Why don't I just go in, try something, randomize it, and then see whether it worked, and then scale it up if it does work, okay? And so that's a perfectly valid question. Do I need to understand anything about culture, evolution, history, uh, differences in psychological traits, social characteristics, if that's my goal? So I'll argue in, in this talk, yes, and I'm going to do it just very simply giving you three examples of settings in which these factors, I think, are important for policy, right? So if you, all you want to do is improve the world today, move forward, not think about the past, do we still need to know about the past or need to know about these cultural differences? And I'll talk about three, give three examples from very mainstream bread and butter, plain Jane development policy. So health and, health and, health and medicine, agriculture, and education. So it doesn't get any more standard than that. Okay, so the first one is health. So there are many examples of basically health interventions being attempted, uh, but then failing. And so the way to think of this is over the past 100 years, there have been dramatic improvements in health knowledge, health technologies. We know how to save lives around the world. So we go in, we devote the resources, we go and attempt to save lives. It's something as simple as a polio vaccine, for example or testing people for HIV and then giving them ARTs. Um, so we do all of that, but then people refuse. For some reason, they say, no, this seems crazy. I don't want to be injected. Uh, the most high profile cases in Ebola is the case of Ebola, where people were afraid that hospitals were actually causing the disease and then selling body parts. Or there are examples of people liberating their relatives by breaking into the, the hospitals and then freeing their relatives which had been infected by Ebola. So why is this? Where does this come from? Okay, so you could say, well, you know, they're just not rational, it doesn't make sense. So if you go back 100 years, the first medical development campaigns were actually implemented by uh, colonizers within Africa. So these are colonial medical campaigns where individuals um, so the colonizers really just wanted to eradicate certain diseases, so sleeping sickness is, is one example, uh, and that's what I'll talk about here. Uh, go to a village, you know basically how to prevent sleeping sickness, you line people up, uh, and you give them uh, prevented, you test them and then give them preventative medicine. So that's, that's what these pictures are here. The test is, that was a spi is a spinal tap, which, isn't, which is the one picture. Um, and so thinking about French colonial medical campaigns in particular, so there's been research done by my students where they basically say, well, where did these campaigns happen in the past? So this is a map of French equatorial Africa. Um, like I said, they were trying to help uh, the populations, but they didn't do it in the nicest, most subtle way. Okay, often they would line up the populations at gunpoint and say, okay, you know, you need to take these inoculations um, or this, th these medicines. And it turned out medicine at this time, in the early um, 1900s, was imperfect. Okay, so the main treatment for sleeping sickness, which is a disease that's transmitted by the tsetse fly, was atoxyl. So it turns out ex post that atoxyl causes blindness or, uh, or vision um, distortion in 20% of the people who take it, right? So it's no longer used, but at that time. So you can imagine these individuals who, it's gonna be people's parents or people's grandparents who are still alive today, experience this. 
And this, in some sense, you can think of this had a negative externality on subsequent uh, development campaigns because they have this memory. Now the WHO, World Bank's coming in and this looks kind of familiar, okay? So what you see basically is this, this here is a, um, a plot uh, called a bin scatter plot of the relationship between the intensity of this historical treatment, which is these colonial medicine campaigns, and then how successful World Bank projects are, particularly World Bank health projects, and that's the one on, on the left. So you can see where these colonial med medical campaigns happened in the past. Today, uh, these projects were less successful. Okay? Uh, on the right are projects unrelated to health. And you can see that you don't see this for things like road infrastructure. If anything, those places that were visited in the past are more successful today. Okay? And you can think, well, what's underlying this lack of success? Well, you know, it's, th there's evidence that it's really suspicion. So here's just one example of this, or distrust of Western medicine. These are refusal rates. So people are offered blood tests to learn if they have HIV or anemia. Uh, and the refusal rates are positively correlated with this history of, of, uh, of colonial medical campaigns. Okay? So here's one example. You know, we know the technology. We know how to make people's lives better. We go to implement it, and you have these vast differences, which depend on this cultural trait, which you can call distrust, which was determined by this historical process. Okay? So knowing the historical process will inform us, maybe we need to approach this group, which had this traumatic history, uh, differently than this other group which didn't have this traumatic history. So that's just one example. Okay. So another example, fertilizer use in Africa. So here's um, just a headline from The Economist uh, just this year. So it's basically, talk, the article talks about this, which is the fact that Africa doesn't use fertilizer. It's not even improving, right? Uh, and here's a well-known agronomist Stephen Carr basically saying, the, um, the, the rest of the world is using fertilizer, not Africa. The only way is we need to subsidize or give it to them for free. Even when you do this, that's what this, this is about, it still isn't successful. Okay? So why wouldn't farmers use fertilizer? The returns are astronomical. It's a very simple technology. You could talk about things like risk aversion, impatience. It turns out if you look at the data, uh, Africa is not more risk averse or not more impatient. Okay? So that doesn't seem to explain it. So we've been doing some work in the Democratic Republic of Congo just trying to understand people's view of the world, uh, the social structure, how things fit together, and we have evidence from vignettes. So here's just a vignette. We, we give them a scenario and then ask them questions. So imagine you're in a village outside of Kananga. So this is a city within uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo. The primary crop is maize. Imagine that one farmer named Mutambo has a maize harvest that is twice as large as all other farmers in the village. Okay? So this is a scenario. So then we ask, what will others believe is the l most likely reason for Matumbo's success? Okay. So it turns out the vast majority of people believe it's witchcraft. That if Matumbo has this yield that's so much higher than everyone else, he must be engaging in witchcraft, black magic, something else. Some people will say hard work or he prayed to God, but the vast majority think it's, it's witchcraft. So, in the same year, one of the other farmers has a particularly terrible harvest, okay? So their crop is eaten by insects. How likely is it that others will blame Matumbo uh, for the ruined crop, okay? And so you can see that the vast majority of people will draw a connection between the two, even though for us, logically, there's no connection at all, right? There's no reason that Matumbo having this good yield, uh, for example, because he used fertilizer, should be related to this other farmer uh, having a yield that gets eaten by insects, right? But in people's mind, because they have this framework of witchcraft where I can benefit by cursing someone else, right? Life in some sense is a zero-sum game. Uh, then if someone does well and another does poorly, it's possible that those things are connected, okay? So will other people in the village expect Matumbo to share some of his new wealth with them? And you see the vast majority of people will expect Matumbo to share. So again, this is a different worldview where redistribution is the norm and redistribution is expected. Okay? And maybe this is related to witchcraft, maybe this is just a completely separate uh, cultural trait. Okay? And then how likely is it that other members of the village will try and sabotage Matumbo's crop in some way? Okay? And so we have different questions. This is if he doesn't share and if he does share. Uh, this is the case where if he doesn't share. And you see the, it's very likely that people will try and sabotage his, his crop. So this is a, just a very different setting than we're used to. So if we're thinking about why don't people use, we're sitting here in Cambridge thinking, why don't people use fertilizer? The economic return is 500%, it's ridiculous. 
but this is the reality, you might start to think, well, you know, would a person want to use fertilizer, particularly if they're the only one in the village, if they're the first mover, uh, and then they face this type of thing. So then you can think of, once we acknowledge this, and this is kind of, you know, isn't out there in terms of uh, knowledge in the literature, then you can start thinking, well, how do we develop policies uh, that try and overcome this? So first, advertising intensively that, the, that this individual or the village as a whole is using fertilizer. Any exceptional growth is from coming from fertilizer is going to be important, for example. Okay. And then you might think, well, this is the DRC. This is the poorest country in the world, some obscure place I don't care about. You find that these, actually, these beliefs are prevalent around the world. They're much more intensive within Africa, but beliefs in witchcraft are evil eye. That's someone can harm you by, uh, by looking at you um, are, are very common. And redistributive pressures, redistributive norms, we really don't have da data on. So the expectation to share if you benefit. Okay. okay, and so the last one I'm gonna talk about is school construction. And this is school construction in Indonesia. So it's a very well-known paper in the economics literature by Esther Duflo, came out in the AR in 2001, I believe, which evaluates a school construction project which the Indonesian uh, government implemented in 1973. Massive, massive project, the largest of its kind. 61,000, almost 62,000 schools, primary schools are built over a seven-year period. Okay? So she examines the impacts on uh, men's education and how that affected wages. You find huge impacts on uh, boys' education and then their wages as men. But it turns out no effect on girls. So she doesn't look at that in her paper, but if you just go to the data sit and ask the natural question, well, were girls also affected? You find no impact on girls. But ever, that average zero effect masks a lot of heterogeneity. So it turns out for some groups, there was a positive and large effect. For others, there was zero effect. So if you went to one district and evaluated the project, you would find it was a huge success. You go to another district, evaluate the project, you'd said it was a complete failure in terms of girls' education. And in research we've done, we found oh, you find the exact same thing in Zambia, which Zambia is another country that in the late 1990s had a large uh, school construction project. So what's going on? Okay. So it turns out this is related to a custom, so uh, a cultural practice. Uh, which exists actually in most, many societies in the world. It's probably the most common uh, marriage custom. And the custom is basically when a man and woman get married, okay, there's a large monetary payment, often about a year's worth of wages. Uh, it takes the form of money, but also in, in kind, from the groom or the groom's parents to the bride's parents. Okay? So, I'm, I have a daughter who's getting married, she's getting married, and while the marriage occurs, or, or just before, I receive a lot of money, okay, as the parents. So what does this at all have to do with school construction, okay? So it turns out, if you look at what's the primary determinant of the value of the bride price, so remember I said this, this is a huge amount of money, it turns out the primary determinant is the level of education of the daughter, okay? Uh, so this is data we collected from Zambia. Uh, from about uh, 1,000 individuals who are married and asking about their bride price and what's the primary uh, factor. And you can see the vast majority of people said that's the first, and then second, and then third, beats all of these other things, uh, moral values, virginity, age, et cetera. Okay? Um, and if you don't believe me, it turns out there's an app you can buy. This is called a Lobola app. So if you're from the southern part of Africa, uh, this is what bride price is called. And you can enter your information, it'll tell you how much bride price you should get. So I did this, I have 10 cows I'm worth. Uh, and if anyone's interested, you can literally get it through, uh, through uh, uh, on your phone. Uh, and education is one of the first things uh, that people ask, or, or that, the, that the app asks. Okay? So it's very clear that education is super important. If you educate your daughter, and we estimate this, uh, basically for if she completes primary school, the value of the bride price increases by 100%. If she you know, completes secondary school, almost another 100%, college another 100%. So these are big differences. So now think of parents who are making the decision, should I educate my daughter? There's big opportunity costs. Uh, she often helps out in the home. She brings, carries water uh, to places with no piped water, looks after other kids. Um, in a bride price society, they're gonna understand that, well, if I educate my daughter three, four, five years down the line, when she gets married, I'm going to have a monetary return to that. Okay? 
in non-bride price societies, that, that monetary return doesn't exist. Okay? And so this basically, it all lines up and explains why in, in bride price societies, it's these societies where you saw this positive um, effect of schooling on female education, places where there is no bride price or the bride price payment is just token or little, uh, basically you don't have uh, the same effect. So again, this is important for policy. So I haven't talked about the history of where bride price comes from, but that's another story. I'm happy to talk about that. But just thinking about this cross-cultural cross uh, difference, this custom, it basically uh, had a huge impact, first order impact, on the efficacy of this development policy. And this is just mainstream, plain Jane development policy. Um, and yeah, it was basically unrecognized until you know, very recently. And if you're implementing this policy, you might think about, well, we might have to have a different policy in certain districts where you, have, where you don't have this practice versus others, assuming we care about educating daughters. Okay. Okay. So that's basically the three examples. So I think, you know, I kind of just kind of wanted to provide these examples to contribute to this, um, to this uh, discussion, which is basically on policy. So what does all of this mean for policy? These, the fact that history affects cultural traits, societal traits, uh, that we observe today and that there's heterogeneity. Um, so I would argue that effective policy requires taking these into account. So these are just three examples of cases where there's the efficacy of the policy depends critically on the history and then the cultural values subsequently. I think the dominant framework right now is a one size fits all. Okay? So even some people will think, I don't even need to go to a developing country. I can just sit back, let the data come in. As long as we randomize treatment or randomize the intervention, uh, then you know, we don't have any issues of causality. And then we can get a causal effect. And then we can scale up if it's good, scale down if it's bad, maybe do a cost-benefit analysis. But I think there is some benefit, actually, to understanding the cultural context, the societal context, um, and the evolutionary process that created that in developing countries. Okay. So thank you. <laughs>